In the previous video, we saw how to define polymorphic lists in Clock. The syntax was a little heavyweight, though. Remember, for our repeat function, we had a bunch of extra stuff we were writing down about this capital X type throughout the definition. This doesn't quite look like uh, the normal code that you might write, say, in OCaml for such a function. Let's see how to simplify the syntax here in Clock. So the first thing we'll start with is noting that we, we can use type inference to our advantage here. As usual in Clock, we don't have to write down the types of everything, uh, all the arguments, for example. In this case, we can leave them out. Totally fine that we don't have to say x is col uh, has type capital type, or that little x has type capital X. All of that information can be inferred by Clock's type inference engine uh, by the information that's contained within the function body here. And that will result in a function that even has the same type as the original one we defined. So repeat prime, which we just defined, has that type. So does repeat, which we originally defined. Uh, they are both functions that take in a type, take in a value of that type, take in a natural number, and give us back a list of elements of that type, capital X. And type inference is what does that. We can do even more, though. We can do better about the syntax. Having to supply that capital X everywhere it occurs uh, is boring. It's also annoying. You can actually leave this out by putting in a wild card, this underscore. Uh, we're familiar with using that from pattern matching so far. Uh, here's a new use for it uh, in that we can leave out the type parameter here. And that says to clock, if it can infer what that's supposed to be, cool, go ahead and do that so that the programmer doesn't have to write it down. So we left off x, capital X, as the argument to nil, as the argument to cons, and as the argument to repeat double prime. That's nice. Of course, we do still have to write it down uh, as an argument here, and that's necessary because, in fact, we need to use that capital X here as the output type list of X. We're also able to use this ability to leave out the type arguments, to write underscores in place of them, even in constructing uh, values of the type. Uh, for example, here's the list containing one, two, three. Now, before, everywhere we had one of these underscores, we were writing nat. Uh, that was annoying to have to type and also made it considerably harder to read, I think. Uh, this is a little more pleasant to read in that we can see the repeated application of cons to one, to two, to three, and to nil. So that makes the example a little bit nicer to write. We could do even better yet, though. Most of the places where we're writing these type arguments or writing underscores to say to infer them, we can actually tell Clock, no, I don't even want to have to write this at all. Like, I don't even want to include that in the syntax at all. I want you to always be responsible for inferring that. I'm handing that task off to you. There's a facility for this in Clock. Uh, it involves the arguments vernacular command here. Uh, this actually is a command that can do way more than we're going to see just right here. Uh, but one of the uses for it is to tell Cock, I want you to always treat an argument as implicit. So the way to do that is to say arguments and then uh, the name of the function or the constructor or whatever value we're working with here. Uh, and then say what argument here we want it to uh, treat as implicit. And we put that in curly braces. So we want to treat the x argument of nil as implicit, the x argument of cons as implicit, and the x argument of repeat as implicit. What that means is I never have to write those, and in fact, I never will be able to write them. Let me show you what, that, what I mean by that. Now, after those definitions, when I say cons1, cons2, cons3, nil, notice I'm not writing nat, uh, I guess, here. I'm not writing underscore there. I'm leaving it out entirely. That's the effect that this arguments command has had. It means that I never write them here. In fact, if I tried to write nat here, that wouldn't even compile at this point. The term one has type nat. Well, it's expected to have a list type. Uh, that's because uh, I'm not supposed to be writing this there anymore. Cock is, is, say, is treating that as the next argument that should have been passed to that function. Okay. So uh, that actually cleans up the syntax quite a bit at this point uh, for these list examples that we're constructing. Still not quite as good as Cox built-in lists. We'll, we'll get, take another step here in a second. But before we do that, let me point out that you don't, for functions like this, have to say this arguments command after defining the function. You can do it at the same time as defining the function. Uh, and it's very simple. Just put the argument you want to be implicit inside of curly braces instead of round parentheses. Right, so this 
capital X argument to repeat triple prime here, uh, we're automatically, as part of the definition here, saying is implicit by making it curly braced. Okay, and what that means is when I call repeat triple prime here, uh, I don't have to, and in fact, it would be illegal to pass capital X in as a, as a type parameter uh, because I've made it implicit. Of course, the reason that I'm not doing it for nil and cons is exactly these arguments commands up here uh, when I made the X parameter to those constructors be implicit. All right, so that gets me an even nicer definition of repeat triple prime. I can do this with a bunch of other functions. And in fact, it's nice to do this right now because we're going to need some of these functions later. So let me just show you. Here's polymorphic versions of append. All right, so this appends one list to another before we define this just for nat lists. Uh, so all I've done is parameterize that on an implicit type parameter, capital X. The lists that are passed in have type list X. That's the output as well. And in the body of it, uh, none of those X's are really showing up anymore because of the implicitness that I have invoked. So that gets me a polymorphic append. I can do the same thing and create a polymorphic reverse function on lists, a polymorphic length function on lists, uh, and all of those are going to work as expected. Uh, we've got some unit tests here. Uh, if you want to look at those, that's great. There's nothing surprising going on here at this point. All that I've done is generalize the previous defin definitions that I had from nat lists to be polymorphic uh, and use implicitness to make them a little nicer to write. There may come times after you've made an argument implicit that you'd like to treat it as explicit again. For example, you might be trying to do something with nil. Here's a common thing that can happen. Uh, you want to define like some value which is equal to nil. Maybe we'll call it my nil. It turns out that doesn't work. Here's why. We told cock that the type argument to nil was implicit. Well, here we didn't provide it. And there's nothing else to give cock a clue in this definition as to what that type argument is supposed to be. It can't figure it out because it really could be anything. It could be nat. It could be bool. Who knows what it's supposed to be? Okay. So we get an error here. It cannot infer the implicit parameter x of nil. If you wanted to do this sort of thing, like uh, bind nil to your own name, you can fix this with an explicit type declaration. It's one way to do it. So maybe you wanted your my nil to actually be the list of natural numbers that is empty. You could do that with a type annotation here that says my nil is actually of type list nat. And then at that point, cock will let you off the hook and say, all right, you don't have to tell me what the implicit parameter is here. I can figure it out from the rest of the types that are present as part of the definition. That's one way to do it. But of course, that, that hard coded the fact that it was natural numbers. What if you didn't even want to do that? Well, there's this piece of syntax, the at sign, that you can prefix uh, a name with when its arguments have been made implicit, and that makes them explicit again. So nil is something that is implicitly parameterized, but at nil goes back to having the original type before any of the arguments were made implicit. So now the type argument x is explicit with at nil. You can use that to give a def definition of my nil prime here. Um, if you wanted to, which is the empty list of natural numbers. Now you're not having to write an, a manual type annotation there. Uh, you can instead pass nat in uh, as an argument to at nil. Or at this point, if you really wanted to rebind the empty list that is uh, parameterized on a type, you could even say uh, definition my nil double prime is at nil uh, period. And so my nil double prime here is, is something that is going to take in a type argument. We can check its type, in fact. My nil double prime. Uh, and that is back to having an explicit type argument. OK. Uh, the one thing we still haven't solved at this point is getting a really nice syntax, though, like Cox built-in syntax for lists. So how can we do that? Our notation command is to the rescue again here. Uh, now that we have all of these pieces in place for polymorphic definitions and implicit param parameters to them, uh, we can define a list syntax for cons, a list notation for cons, which is our double colon operator, uh, which is the cons that we just defined. Of course, that cons has an implicit type parameter at this point. 
Uh, note how important that is, because if we had to supply it explicitly here, uh, what would it be? Well, we'd have to like somehow maybe annotate this piece of syntax with what the type parameter is supposed to be, and we don't want to have to do that. So we, it's good that we have uh, type parameters that are implicit at this point. Same thing for nil, its type parameter is implicit. Uh, we've got our syntax for lists uh, constructed with square brackets, which is just repeated application of cons again. And we've got a double plus notation for list append here, uh, which we defined just a bit ago with uh, an implicit type parameter itself. Okay, so by using Cox syntactic notation feature, uh, we have now coded up ourselves this nice kind of syntactic sugar for lists. Uh, and we can use that to write lists uh, exactly as we're used to from Cox's uh, notion of lists from the standard library. Uh, we can even, you know, define our own, th prove our own theorems about it. For example, this theorem uh, proves that append is associative for lists. That's something uh, you've done before, probably for natural numbers uh, in an exercise. Uh, and there's really nothing different in terms of the proof technique going on from when we did this for natural numbers. Uh, all that's different is we've parameterized on a list of x here, uh, and we've got for all x. Uh, the proof itself is the same kind of uh, proof script with just intros and induction and simplify and reflexivity and so forth that we've seen before. Okay, so that finishes up creating lists as polymorphic types uh, in the same way that you could use them from Cox's own standard library, uh, but we've coded them up ourselves from first principles. So that's really pretty cool, right? Uh, there's nothing that needed to be built into the language itself other than the facility for doing inductive type definitions and making arguments implicit and providing syntactic notations. That's really powerful.